Following the Kirtland banking crisis in 1838, Joseph Smith left town in the dead of night. The town of Kirtland was basically bankrupt. Because of this, ownership of the temple was, was claimed by several people. John Hamer and Lachlan Mackay will talk about the ownership of the Kirtland Temple and all the strange ownership problems. It's a little bit like a soap opera. We'll also hear an episode where people storm the temple with guns and knives to try to take ownership of the temple. Check out our conversation. Please invite your friends and family to share this episode on Facebook or YouTube or however you do social media. It will really help our rankings. Also, give us an iTunes review. That will help more people find out more about us. Now check out our conversation. We, I talked with Mark Staker, um, and we talked a little bit about the Kirtland banking crisis. Uh, as I recall, there was a very violent scene that occurred in the Kirtland Temple. Could, could you talk about that uh, and how it relates to the banking crisis? Sure. So I, I'm guessing this is the one where Joseph Smith Sr. is in the pulpit up on the West End, um, and the dissenters are uh, concerned and hoping to uh, probably take possession of the temple, and they storm to the front with guns and knives drawn. Um, men, this is I think Oliver Huntington, one of the Huntington boys said, um, them that had chicken hearts dove out the windows for safety. Mm -hmm. um, the police are called in to restore order. Uh, they rush in and they knock over a stovepipe. So I just imagine soot kind of filling the room. And the best part is after that chaos, they eject the belligerents and resume the services of the day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, uh, so I think that's probably the Yeah, that might, <laughs> might have been quite a service. <laughs> we, we don't talk about that in the LDS tradition very often. I, I remember reading that somewhere and just going, wow. I, I think one of them is even there. They're walking from the front to the back, in some cases, over the back of the pew. So stepping from pew box to pew box, because oh, wow. the aisles are full of people. So they have to, to walk on the top of the pew boxes to get up there. Oh, that, that must have been quite, quite an interesting mm -hmm. thing. So, um, so I'm trying to remember, I believe it was 1838, uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, that Joseph Smith, things got so bad that he basically left in the middle of the mm -hmm. night. Um, what, what happened to the temple after that, that time period? So initially we leased the temple to the Western Reserve Teachers Seminary in Kirtland Institute. It's a five-year lease. There's going to be a teacher's training school on the second floor and then um, a model school for children on the third floor, so a place where the teachers could practice on the kids. Uh, they move out after a year complaining that there are too many steps and that the temple is too hard to heat. Uh, by that time though, the church is growing again in Kirtland. Um, so we'd gone from you know, 131 to 2,000 members there by 38, back to 100 maybe by 39, back to 4 to 500 by 42 and 43. They're worshiping there regularly. But Lyman White comes through and convinces the members to gather to Nauvoo. Um, what had happened is we had purchased all that land in Nauvoo on credit. And the only way that we had to pay for it is to resell it to gathering converts. And so if they're stopping in Kirtland, they're not buying in Nauvoo. And that was becoming uh, a pretty significant financial hardship. So out of that, you have the language that talks about Kirtland will be scourged. We actually um, uh, uh, remove, we, we get rid of any stake that is not in Hancock County, Illinois, or Lee County, Iowa, just across the river, to encourage the gathering to Nauvoo. The people in Kirtland make an impassioned plea that they're doing good work, they're caring for the poor, and they, they get the okay to stay, um, but they do shrink a little bit again. But they are intentionally um, waylaying English converts that are passing by on Lake Erie. You know, <laughs> empty homes, beautiful temple to worship in, you know, you're gonna die if you go to Nauvoo. Oh, wow. um, uh, so that caused some friction and some of the Kirtland stake leaders are disfellowshipped over that for a time. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but they're, they're relatively small again by 44. Joseph's killed. Initially, many are loyal to James Strang, um, and he is there by, I think, 46, preaches to 800, I'm sorry, preaches for eight hours at a stretch. Um, there are, at times, people there loyal to William McClellan, at times, James Colin Brewster, at times, William Smith. Um, just a series of small Latter-day Saint tradition churches coming and going. Martin Harris is worshiping with whoever happens to be there. The earliest members of the reorganization are worshiping there by 1860. We got a branch going by about 1874, 
That one didn't survive. The current ranch dates to 1886, and they're still going. Hmm. Now, I heard a story um, actually from a former Community of Christ member who's actually out of the S now about a sheep shed. That the, te that the temple was turned into a sheep shed. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I, I don't think so. I think part of that is a misunderstanding of, of the culture. So you see boxed pews, <laughs> and they look like sheep pens. <laughs> Um, but I think also part of that was an attempt to make us all f feel better because we had not been able to hold on and preserve the, the sacred space. Um, I do think that the temple at times, you know, it's really hard to heat. So it's not like there's a congregation meeting there weekly through those years often. But when missionaries would come through, they would sweep it out and preach there. And various Latter-day Saint churches are having conferences there. Uh, there was a time, probably in about 1859, I think it's the low point, at times the temple doors would stand open and the local farmers wouldn't pin their livestock and I think something could wander in and was there until it could wander out. Uh, Joseph III described something like that in the 1860s saying the basement was open and that animals could wander in and out. Uh, I think that's the roots of w the temple has been intentionally turned into a sheep shed, but I don't think that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting things to me was to, to learn about ownership of the temple. Because um, I understand it's very, very complicated. And, um, can, you, can you tell us about, about sure. the, the different ownership changes over the yeah. years? Kim Loving uh, did amazing work. He was our stake president in Kirtland. He's now deceased, but was an attorney. Uh, and he published an article in the Mormon History Association Journal on Kirtland Temple ownership. Um, so. Um, it's a mess early on. Um, the temple at times is sold in the 1830s um, by people who don't yet own it. <laughs> was one of them Brigham Young? No, Brigham's not in the mix. But I mentioned that to, to uh, Richard Bennett and he told me that Brigham tried to sell it. Well, that is true. Brigham, Brigham did try to sell it, but that doesn't mean that he owned it. Um, <laughs> or that he actually successfully sold yeah. it. So there is an advertisement in a Nauvoo newspaper, um, the 12 are trying to sell the Kirtland and Nauvoo temples. I think it's 46, in the belief that whoever buys them will care for them, uh, maintain them, and that the church could come back later and, and redeem them. Um, but there are four uh, strands of title with the temple. All of them have some problems early on. Um, at times, Joseph owns it personally. At times, he owns it in behalf of the church. Um, when we ran into fin financial difficulty in Kirtland, he had signed it over to William Marks to protect it from creditors. Um, and then Marx had signed it back to Joseph um, in his role as, as church president. So it's with Joseph in behalf of the church at Joseph's death. Um, to try and, and kind of forward their claim though, the 12 asked William Marx to sign a quick claim deed to the 12, which Marx did. Uh, of course, the problem is he doesn't have anything to convey. He had already conveyed it back to Joseph. Um, there are, again, attempts to strengthen claims Eventually, the temple is sold for $10,000 to a non-member friend of the church, George Edmonds, Jr. Um, he later sells it back for, I don't know, a few dollars, $150. Uh, there's a lawsuit, 1859, Grandison Newell, who had been public enemy number one, if you're a Latter-day Saint in 1830s Kirtland, he convinced friends in the Ohio State Legislature to pass legislation specifically so that Joseph's properties in Kirtland could be sold to recoup the costs of prosecuting Joseph for the Kirtland Bank case. Um, winds through the courts in Painesville, Ohio, Lake County, Ohio. The temple and 13 acres eventually sell for $150. The guy that buys it happens to be Grandison Newell's grandson-in-law. <laughs> and then the same day, he sells just the temple to Russell Huntley for $150. So Huntley was a Latter-day Saint of some variety. He eventually joins the reorganization and conveys the temple to Joseph Smith III and Mark Forskett for $150. Um, we got really interested though, not in temple ownership, but in identity questions. And so we had attorneys telling us, if you don't do anything, you're somewhat cloudy ownership, because there were problems in all of those change of title, your cloudy ownership will become clear by 1881. So we could have done nothing and had clear ownership through adverse possession. 21 years is the mark in Ohio. You possess, you're proclaimed to the world, it's mine, nobody you're objects. Yeah. Um, so 21 years would have been 1881. 
But again, ownership isn't what it was all about for us, it was identity. So we created a lawsuit, the Kirtland Temple suit, to try and prove to the world that we were Joseph Smith Jr.'s church. Uh, unfortunately, our local council didn't show up and our um, council who was not from Ohio went ahead anyway. Uh, and that's the 1880 Kirtland Temple suit. Actually started pretty well for us. We had written the brief, given it to the judge. He just read it back. The reorganized church is the true and lawful successor to and entitled to the property thereof, Joseph Smith Jr.'s church. Woohoo! <laughs> we said. But then he said, oh, but you filed the case wrong, case dismissed. Oh, <laughs> we, uh, and I don't know what happened then. I'm, part of me thinks that the attorney must have been so embarrassed, he left that part off. <laughs> oh, really? But fairly quickly, we are trumpeting to the world the, the judge's decision without passing on uh, case dismissed. <laughs> oh. So now let me ask you a question, because Brian Hales, when I was talking to him, he had mentioned that the Temple Lot, who are known as the Hedrickites, and we do need to get into all these schisms. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they were the ones that had owned it, and then the, the that, RLDS Church. Temple Lot. You're talking about. I'm talking so, about the Temple Lot yes. Church. In Church. In, yes. But we're talking now about... So. No, Brian Hales told... Because I got confused. Because no. Brian Hales said that the Temple Lot had purchased, had had taken ownership of the Kirtland Temple, and then, no. No. No, and no, no, then, no. Um, the RLDS Church went running out of the courthouse and said, "Woohoo, we won!" And even though they hadn't won, and kicked yeah. out the Temple yeah. Lot people. So, so it's just a more complicated story. So you're just conflating two temple cases. So there's the Kirtland Temple suit that's first, and then when this became, uh, as far as the RLDS Church was concerned, a real uh, PR win, you know, even though it's kind of a not really a win, not really. <laughs> but anyway, it seemed pretty great. And so then that made um, uh, the leadership. They're like, "Hey, we could get this. We could keep this thing going," <laughs> you know. And so then there's a suit that happens in Independence with the Hedrickites, who do have possession of a portion of the original temple lot. And so then their suit, uh, you know, by the RLDS Church, with the same idea in mind. And in fact, actually. Uh, it does serve the same PR purpose because there's a bunch of different rulings and at, at one of the appeals levels before the whole thing gets dismissed and out and not in our favor. Again, there's a nice ruling that we're the true successor legally as if the court matters to decide these kind of things. But anyway, and then that got, gets used. But so you're just conflating the two cases. And well, Brian is. Well, Brian yeah, Brian, Brian is. Because Brian, because I, I was familiar with Independence, I wasn't familiar with Kirtland, but what he said was that the RLDS church had cheated the, the yeah. Hedrickites out, and then then in Independence, a similar sort of a thing, and the LDS church said, no, we're the so true The Hedrickites are only a tiny group at the time, and they their whole thing was to go back to Independence. They didn't, they were never in, you know, Kirtland anymore. They were a branch that's from Bloomington, uh, you know, four or five branches in the Bloomington, Illinois area. Uh, they reorganized when Johnny Page, um, uh, who'd been one of the apostles uh, who had, hadn't gone with Brigham Young, uh, reorganizes and they make uh, Granville Hedrick uh, the new prophet president of their church. Do they make him prophet? I'm not sure. I think so. Anyway, and so then he has a revelation or right before then or right around then to, that they need to go back and re redeem Zion. And so they move from, or oh, slowly anyway, they move from their branches in Bloomington, Illinois to Independence and, and they go back and and purchase themselves, not not by going and taking legal claim and saying we're the true church and things like that and this property belongs to us. They, it had subsequently become part of the city of Independence Platte and been divided into lots and everything like that. So they, they slowly start purchasing up the lots uh, until they have the portion of the temple lot that they own and then they, then they, and then they owned it and they were done and they moved there. But they never, ever since they organized you know, in, in there, they never went to Gertland there. So. It's a oh. completely different case. Okay. <laughs> so, that, that was my understanding as well. Same RLDS tactic, different group. <laughs> <laughs> the first one was just us fighting with ourselves and then winning and deciding that that was going <laughs> to So it is true we were fighting with ourselves, but, but we did name we as named defendants the, defendant. the church in Utah. <laughs> right. Not really. Yeah. Not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because some of the deeds had variations of that name on them. So it was John Taylor and the church in Utah. <laughs> oh, really? And of course it was... The Cohab hunts, cohabitation hunts, so John couldn't. Yeah, so they didn't, they didn't respond to, the, to that Kirtland suit. So that's why I say we just had it with ourselves, although yeah. obviously we, 
pretended to invite yeah. other people to the party, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Whereas what happened with the temple lot suit then is when we when we decide we're going to have you know round two, when we actually are suing you know the poor Hedrickites, um, that what happens is that then uh, everybody gets named and the LDS church or the church in Utah or whatever come uh, shows up at the party, <laughs> and so then they are they are su suddenly are a. Um, uh, you know, like on the side of then the, you know, like a, on the side of the Hedrickites to kind of, you know, the enemy, my enemy is my friend kind of thing. And so they're helping the Hedrickites prove that the, the Josephites are wrong and they're doing this kind of thing. And then this interesting thing happens with the Temple Lot suit, which is every early Mormon who's still around, they all show up and they testify under oath about all sorts of things, including, you know, sexual relations regarding polygamy which we otherwise wouldn't have and it becomes this incredible source that you otherwise wouldn't have in the Victorian era so everybody you know testifies and they get on the record including all kinds of disinterested parties so like Strangite uh, apostles show up and they explain their understanding of the history of the uh, of polygamy and things like that and so they're not even an interested party at all necessarily <laughs> but everybody showed up so it sounds like the flaw in our strategy was not filing the the temple lot suit early enough because of the 1890 <laughs> uh, and the manifesto, if we would. I don't know. If it, I don't even know that it was a smart strategy under any circumstance. I don't think it was, but but it'd been earlier than nobody from the West could have shown up. That's right. Um, yeah. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with John and Locke. As many of you know, LDS President Thomas S. Monson passed away last week. In LDS tradition, that means the first presidency is dissolved and the most senior apostle, likely Russell M. Nelson, will succeed President Monson as church leader. John Hamer will describe why the first presidency dissolves. Even though in the LDS tradition, there is this idea that the first presidency dissolves and then the senior most apostle always succeeds, the only reason that that is the idea is because they didn't want to have Sidney Rigdon be in charge, you know, I mean, it doesn't say that in the Doctrine and Covenants or anything like that. So there's no canonical, there's no canon law thing, thing that says anything of the kind. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you like our page on Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents. You can subscribe at YouTube at YouTube.com slash Gospel Tangents. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents, as well as make sure that you subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss any of our episodes. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our videos. Thanks again.